Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Brains at Bay meetup. Uh, we're glad to have you here. So Brains at Bay is a machine learning meets neuroscience meetup. And it started in Bay Area, California, but it's now online. And the idea is to discuss brains part machine learning algorithms. And we want the perspective from both neuroscientists and machine learning researchers. And we're trying to draw inspiration from neuroscience um, and use that uh, inspiration and, and the things we can learn from neuroscience in order to improve machine learning algorithms. So we already had meetups on continuous learning last year, on sparse representations, on having learning, and we had predictive processing the past month. And if you have suggestions for next meetup, please uh, connect and uh, join our meetup and you can leave a message in our message board. So today we have uh, Stefan, Ron, and Brian talking about lateral connections in the neocortex. So I will let Supta introduce them. Uh, thanks, Lucas. So I'm uh, thrilled to have Stefan, Ram, and Brian here. I've been wanting to invite Stefan. I've known him for a couple of years. I've been wanting to invite him to speak at Nementa for a while. So I'm really thrilled to have them and, and make this possible. Uh, so as introduction, Stefan Mihalas is a researcher at the Allen Institute in Seattle. At the Allen Institute, um, Stefan integrates anatomical and physiological connectivity data to generate models of visual perception. He works towards building a series of models of increasing complexity for both individual components, such as neurons, synapses, and microcircuits, as well as for large portions of the entire system. Before the Allen Institute, Stefan was a postdoc at Johns Hopkins University, and before that, he received his PhD in physics from Caltech. Ram Iyer is a scientist at the Allen Institute, where he's involved in efforts to develop theoretical and computational models of the mouse visual system. Ram obtained his, obtained his PhD in theoretical high energy physics from the University of Southern California. Uh, Brian, who was a researcher at the Allen Institute until very recently, uh, Brian received his PhD in biomedical engineering from Johns Hopkins University and is currently a computer vision researcher and kitware. So Stefan, Ram and Brian, uh, we're really happy to have you here and um, looking forward to your presentation. Go for it. So, um... Hello everyone, um, I am going to talk today about one particular line of study which we recently published and uh, we are going to um, focus on one type of connections which we observe throughout the brains which are the lateral connections and we have an idea as to how this can be involved much more generally in cortical computations and how can we take some of the principles which we uh, have in cortical computations and apply them to artificial neuronal networks? The outline of the talk today, I am going to talk a little uh, uh, on an introduction, which is much more general as to why are we interested in cortex and how is it organized? I'm going to present our, one of our general hypotheses, which is the idea that um, there isn't just one optimization function for um, neuronal circuits, but there are multiple optimization functions at different levels. I'm going to talk very briefly, one or two slides about the theory, which is uh, going to say, how can we implement such computations? Ram is going to uh, talk about how the, some of these theoretical predictions map these observations. And uh, Brian is going to talk about how can we take these type of ideas from biology and apply them in the context of artificial neuronal networks. And we dubbed the network CNNX or convolutional neuronal network with extra classical receptive fields. So to begin with, why is cortex interesting? Um, to me, and why study? One of the things which I was always very puzzled by the cortex is the incredible diversity in terms of size regarding uh, evolution. So for example, you can see that uh, uh, you can have, it's not as if big brains are necessarily, or big cortex is necessarily a big evolutionary pressure which is going to monotonically increase throughout evolution. For example, in here, this is a uh, comparative anatomy paper, 
which looks at the fact that elephant and elephant shrew, I can't even see it where it is, the uh, cortices of these uh, types of mammals, which can be very, uh, which are very close evolutionarily with each other, can be on hugely different size. Um, there is uh, the same uh, happening in multiple in multiple parts uh, in multiple parts of the uh, evolutionary tree. Um, we know we have studied the long range projection of the cortex, and boy, are they complex. We have published multiple papers regarding the uh, characterizations of the long range of the long range connections in the brain, and I recommend several of them if you if you have an interest on mapping uh, long range uh, macroscopic uh, connectivity. But the interesting thing which we are going to focus on today is not at the global system level, but rather what happens at the level of a microstructure. What happens at the level of uh, tens or hundreds of microns inside of the tissue and the types of cells which are present, and that is very different. Unlike the, um, I would say, relatively difficult to explain long-range connections, the short-range connections are much more lawful. There is a microstructure which is relatively similar across area. It's not perfect. I would say that these are images which are going to be as, an, as far as it goes. And not even that it is similar across areas. It has a non-trivial level of similarities across, mul across multiple species. Um, such that this, is, this has been the origin of uh, I would say long-term ideas in computational uh, neuroscience in which there are going to be a set of computations which are going to be implemented locally by the circuit which form, the, uh, which form a set of basis functions or basis computations which are needed for the global, for the global computations of the cortex. And uh, I would say that uh, uh, Jeff Hawkins has been a pioneer in this area and has published, uh, there, there has been a pretty influential book which he published in this area, which has, at least has influenced my thinking about it. Um, there are, of course, multiple complications when comparing artificial neuronal networks and real neuronal networks. I would say that one of the things which pops out relatively fast is that there are so many cell types which are present in uh, biological networks, which are rarely considered in artificial neuronal networks. And uh, I'm not going to say that we solved this problem, but I'm going to say that we touch, we begin to touch upon some of the questions regarding multiple cell types being present in a network in the models which we have here. Um, now, delving in a little bit more, even more deeply, on uh, what are some of the connectivity principles at the level of the microstructure. Uh, there are some things which are uh, relatively clearly happening. Um, it has been described functionally that uh, cells with much more similar response properties in vivo have the tendency to have a much stronger connection and higher connection probability. This is very similar to the Hebbian uh, wiring principle in which you'd expect the uh, connectivity to be proportional to the covariances of the responses or more biologically put cells which fire together, wire together. Um, those are equivalent principles, just talking about it biologically or mathematically. Uh, there is another aspect, which is going to be the fact that a lot of the connections in uh, the brain, the connection probability uh, inside of the local uh, tissues decreases very rapidly with distance. So we have uh, measurements. There have been multiple measurements from the tissue which uh, present the fact that the connection, the uh, connection probability 
precipitously drops after uh, about 100 or 150 uh, micrometers. Those are the principles of connectivity among excitatory neurons. Among inhibitory neurons, uh, things are a little bit different and I would say more complicated from some perspective, simpler from others. One which is going to be the fact that um, there are so many inhibitory neuron subtypes such that beyond the fact that we need to think about what these neurons represent, what is their function, we need to think about their cell type. And there have been, uh, don't have the capacity of doing a full literature review regarding this. There are many uh, works which have characterized uh, this pretty well. I would recommend a paper from Andreas Tolias from Science 2015, one from Massimo Scanziani uh, from uh, 2013, in which they characterize the logic among uh, inhibitory neurons. Uh, want to say that these are generally relative simplifications. So if you remember when we talked about characterizations of cell types, I think that uh, from a uh, pure cell type classification, we can talk maybe about 50 inhibitory cell types in uh, just in uh, brain area V1. However, most of the time when people talk about these types of connectivity, they are limiting to usually three cell classes. Uh, they come with different names. Uh, uh, for example, from Tolias, they uh, characterized them as uh, pyramidal targeting interneurons, inhibitory specific interneurons, and master. Uh, uh, Scanziani prefers to use uh, terms which are dependent on more traditional cell type classifications based on some of the proteins which are expressed by the cells. For example, somatostatin expressing cells, parvalbumin expressing cells, or VIP expressing cells. But generally, often there is a rule in which these uh, particular cell types are connected. And I think that this, I like this schematic, which is presented from uh, Massimo Scanziani's group. Now, talking about the global organization, it's not, well, while it is relatively complicated, it is also not random. I think that uh, some of these ideas of uh, hierarchical organizations, again, have been present in the literature for quite some time. Uh, a, a very influential line of studies has been done by Fellman and Van Essen, and this is the famous Van Essen diagram of the hierarchical organization of the um, visual uh, of the areas in macaque uh, to describe these streams. And one of the things which I want to make a link between neuroscience and computer science is that hierarchy does not mean feed forward. There is a huge difference between these. Hierarchy just means that there are different types of connections which are moving feed forward and feedback and lateral. It does not mean the lack of feedback or lateral connections which are present. Um, recently, uh, we also had a um, paper in which we mathematically described the uh, hierarchy uh, in the mouse cortex and we had the capacity to put uh, to characterize these types of feedforward feedback uh, connections uh, in this tissue and end up with a mathematical formula and uh, proved that even though the hierarchy is relatively shallow, for a mouse we only have about two levels of hierarchy going throughout, going throughout the cortex. The hierarchy is highly significant from a statistical perspective, so it is weak, but at the same time, very, very clearly hierarchically organized, both at the level of areas, which we have, and at the level of modules, with sensory types modules and association modules being present at relatively different levels. But then even if we zoom inside of uh, one of these areas, we still see a hierarchy. 
we have the capacity to organize this hierarchy, which brings us back to some of the general principle which we are interested in tackling. And I would describe it more like a hope for a line of research which has long preceded us and it's probably going to continue for a while, which is the general idea that the hope is that since we have these anatomically relatively similar uh, circuits, that the general principle organization is going to be that a set of similar or canonical computations when organized in a hierarchical manner are going to give rise to many of the cortical computations properties which we see. To hey, Stefan. Yes. Um, yeah, I have, a, I have a quick question. If you go back to that hierarchy index chart, yes. uh, that, was, yes. that was really interesting. You know, you mentioned the hierarchy is relatively flat. Yes. But you have all of these fractional numbers. What, what, what is the hierarchical hierarchy index here? Sure. Uh, the hierarchy index would classify um, how many of the connections um, perfectly align with the idea of the hierarchy within an area. So let's imagine that uh, if I were to have uh, uh, three areas and all the connections between them would be perfectly lawful that from level one, all the connections would be feed forward. All the connections which we measured would be feed forward to level two. From level two, all the connections would be feed forward to level three. From level one, all of the connections would be feed forward to level three and all the other connections would be feedback. Then what we would have in terms of a hierarchy index, we would have level one would be in here, we, we put uh, across the average, level one would be at minus one, the second one would be at zero, and the third one would be at plus one. Okay, got it. Now, yeah. if we've got a particular cell type or a particular type of connection which we measure, which does not fit these, we look for every area, what fraction of connections correspond to uh, the lawful description of feed forward versus feedback versus how many don't. If you're going to have a connection which is going to move laterally or a connection which does not respect this, these are going to give us the, these are going to give us the fractional, the fractional index. Okay, yeah, thank you. So, so this clearly shows there's you know, some sort of a hierarchy, but that there's also a lot of non-hierarchical connections. Mm -hmm. The number of non-hierarchical, the number of connections which do not follow the hierarchy is relatively large. Yeah. So there is a backbone which is present, but that, that backbone we can extract mathematically if we do lots of measurements. But that doesn't mean that there isn't the, there are lots of connections which do not necessarily follow that to the law. That's much more, bio, that's much more biological than physics where you, you can describe a law and then you're going to have a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of violations. Yeah, thanks, Ste that's a nice Stefan, chart. Yeah. Yes. Uh, can you talk a little bit how was the, this data collected? Can you explain a little bit? Sure, this, is, this was not the main part. I, this was just part of the introduction in order to set up our system. That is a, that is a totally different paper than what I'm going to talk about today. Um, the data has been collected, I would say, for uh, about four years, and it has been track tracing in which a virus, which expresses GFP in the axons of the neurons, has been injected in different positions inside of the mouse brain. And um, the brains have undergone a, a two-photon tomography to describe where the connections are going. Based on that, there was a segmentation and we picked up things which look like axons and we computed a um, um, whole brain connectivity model, but this is not like an EM model where you look one cell goes to the other, but rather statistical, which is going to tell you where one cell type in a particular area is going to project. 
we did an unsupervised learning algorithm to classify feedforward versus feedback connections by simply assuming that uh, you can think of these as a one-dimensional embedding in which the type, not the strength of the connection, defines the directionality, uh, such that we end up classifying brains not... Uh, lots of people like to classify the connect... to characterize the connections in the brain as a graph. I would say that uh, that is in our hands, that was relatively difficult. We got way more interesting answers, not when looking at graph theoretical description of the connectivity, but rather thinking of it as a multigraph, in which rather than having just connections to be characterized by strength or weight, we also have connections to be characterized by type. And in here, one relatively simple type would be feedforward, feedback, or lateral. Any other comments? Thanks. So uh, coming back to setting up the problem for the study, which we are going to talk, is this general hope that we can describe local and global computations, and uh, we can begin to think of a link between what are the computations which are implemented uh, by a circuit. In here, what I'm going to say is that we can think from a hypothesis-driven model to say what are, to try to think from this, not in a data-driven as we've done before in the paper where we construct models which are based on the data, but rather we can also construct models based on the hypothesis as to what the system computes. It's a very different world in which the origin is defined by the hypothesis of computation rather than by the data. And what we are going to focus on today is going to be a system which is described like this. We have an area or a, a visual system in the mouse, which we imagine that it is optimized for a global computation. For example, object recognition. I don't think that that is the best, but that is one example which can be given of a global computation. And there is this system is organized by a set of local circuits, and each of the local circuit is optimized for a different set of computations for local computations. And in here, I'm going to try to make the, to present the thesis for us that this local, uh, the one of the very important local computations is going to be contextual integration. You can also, uh, this, a description like this can also be viewed from a machine learning perspective of having a uh, supervised learning system and an unsupervised learning system which need to work together. So in order to make this work, since I just provided an example of object recognition as an example, our desire would be to characterize local computations which help arbitrary global computations. We don't want necessarily to put in to pre-build the, uh, pre the, global, uh, the global computation. We want to make it, to make it arbitrary. And behind this, I'm actually going to ask the audience in here to guess what is behind the red square. So I, someone says a bird. So. <laughs> <laughs> some, of us, some of us have a prior knowledge of this some, particular some image. Some have a prior knowledge because you have seen, the, because some people have seen this talk before. And uh, a bird would be a very good, I'm not going to present some of the future work. Uh, we have, <laughs> some, uh, th th there are some of those descriptions in terms of uh, trying to make somewhat more complex priors. For the time being, I'm just going to use a very simple okay. prior, which is going to be just a back. And yeah, so Mark uh, Wilson had said more moose, someone said fleas, and uh, <laughs> so I think more moose sounds good to me. <laughs> more moose sounds good. The general idea behind this is that there is a tremendous amount of information which is present in the context of natural images. And whatever you want to do, are you a hunter going to shoot it? Are you a, a photographer to just try to get it? Or um, even if you don't necessarily need to identify it, to, to try to see, are you a, uh, uh, try to, try to think as an um, 
from many perspectives, the function which you need to apply to this, it doesn't really matter. A lot of the contextual information is present irrespective of that. Now let's put, this is the part where I'm going to talk a little bit about math and the general idea, I'm going to pick two patches in there and going to attach receptive fields to those particular elements. And um, the uh, a relatively important note which I want to make is that again, we want to have a computation which is uh, the, that the local computations which can be implemented is arbitrary and the, uh, the global computation needs to be arbitrary and the local computation has to help it, but we can't make it absolutely anything. For us, we started, we need to have a relatively extensive set of assumptions and I'm going to present here the most important ones. I can point to a few others uh, as we go through, but the important element which we need is that whatever that computation is, it has to use very simple a very simple representation which is the idea that the neurons represent probabilities of features being present in a localized part of the world. For the math, we'll need to make use of the independence of features, of probabilities of features coming from uh, patches which are going to be around. So how am I going to describe the uh, mathematically pointing this is going to be the fact that the notation which I'm going to use Fc is the classical uh, is the uh, firing rate caused by the classic, by presentation of a, a stimulus in the classical receptive field. So just the direct representation which is going to be present. So this represents uh, as a function of the probability of a feature, uh, of feature N, um, uh, uh, or feature K being present in patch N, of the image X. And since this represents probability, we need to have a normalization. Coming, oh, coming back to um, this idea, one of the assumptions, so we uh, have the idea of the uh, firing rate representing probabilities of feature being present. And here is an example of a potential feature, but they can be way more complex than that. And one of our most important assumptions is that uh, for the math to easily work, but it turns out not to be so important when we negate it in artificial neuronal network, is that neurons with classical receptive fields in patch one, the only thing which they know about the image in patch two is via lateral connections which are going to be present in here. So given that, if we expand the knowledge in patch two on a series of features which we can consider to be complete such that they actually describe all the information about the uh, image which we are interested in, we can describe the conditional probability of one feature being present in the image as a function of what are going to be other features which are present in the other patch and how likely they are going to be present in this image. And again, based on our approximation, it is very important that features which are present in image, uh, in image patch one do not directly depend on image patch two, only indirectly depend on the uh, only indirectly depend on the firing rate of the neurons which are present. Now, given this assumption, we can actually compute, given this expansion, we can expand these for many patches surrounding the current one and uh, use, a uh, and use a little bit of uh, mathematics to go and say what is going to be the dependence of one feature being present inside of the image given the firing rates of all the surrounding neurons. And given this formula, this looks very much like an 
artificial neuronal network, if we are going to take this nasty term and consider it to be a synaptic weight, we map these elements to firing rates of, uh, to, to firing rates of the neurons. There is only one problem that this is not your standard artificial neuronal network that at least for our perspective, we would need lateral connections to be present, which have a multiplicative term. We can use an approximation by doing a Taylor expansion to do this with uh, additive terms as well. Now, how does this particular, how does this particular term, which I uh, called uh, something which can be presented as a weight, if we do this now averaged over many, many images, what we see is that this term maps very well to a modified Hebbian learning. It's very close to a Hebbian learning. I'm not going to go into the details as to what the differences are. Uh, is a Hebbian learning which depends primarily on the firing rate which is caused by feedforward connections. So in order to be able to compute what, how these connections look like in a system, the only thing which we are going to need is a set of classical receptive field responses and the question of, uh, of uh, statistics of uh, the statistics of natural seams. So this is a theory at the moment, again, let me, let me recapitulate, where we started with general idea of computation and we make predictions about connections without any type of measurements. These are the only things which are going to be needed. So this is a parameter free model coming from a hypothesis of computation. And this can be implemented. We can think of this rather than as a set of equations. We can think of it as a set of network, uh, as a set of network models. And Ram is going to describe how the, uh, Ram is going to describe how the, um, um, how these connections map to uh, reality. Now, so, uh, just a quick question again on the previous slide. Yes. So the weights are dependent purely on the feed forward classical uh, receptive field, right? Uh, uh, it, there, there's no, it, when you're computing these weights, there's no assumption of uh, any sort of lateral impact. That is but, very important. That, that is very important. And that is something which we are interested in continuing this study in the current work. They are purely dependent on the feed forward because the, uh, that, that is how the mathematics ends up being easy. Yeah. If you begin to put the dependence on the lateral one, you can begin to think you can get more illusory percepts because, because of the question of independence there is. So I'm, uh, I'm not saying that biology needs to be like this. I'm saying that the math works really well if that, if that is the case. I mean, the, the, math, the math works if, if that is the case. But at the same time, there would be, if we were to replace this not by a modified Hebbian learning, but rather more of a true Hebbian learning, there are ideas that it can actually end up with more biological systems, but at the same time, it's not going to be optimal. Yeah. Well, as I understand, these lateral connections primarily are connecting to sort of more distal areas of the dendrite, dendritic tree, and they're, they don't have a very direct impact on the cell firing as well. So biology may, may, there may be an interesting match here as well. Yeah, I, I do think that these are interesting correspondences to the type of neuronal model which you like to describe on these later, lateral connections which you, uh, uh, which you describe in general. Ram, do you want to request? Uh, yep. All right. How do I prove? Okay. Okay. All right. So thanks, Stefan, and hello, everyone. Uh, so Stefan has set it up nicely. Where? Um, sorry. Let me just make sure I'm able to scroll through. You need to click on the window to, for it to be active. Yep. Okay. okay. Um, just checking. Yeah. Uh, okay. So Stefan has set it up nicely for me to be able to describe how we took this theoretical slash, you know, uh, theoretical formalism or this network model. And what I will primarily be talking about is how we took this network model uh, and used, uh, you know, in vivo experimental data from mouse visual cortex to be able to try and compare how well 
the predictions from our model match some of the experimental observations that ha- that you know Stefan presented a few slides ago in terms of you know uh, what the specificity of connections looks like, you know what the distance dependence of connections looks like, and so on. So uh, to begin with, uh, I. I'll just briefly describe the data was collected uh, by our experimental colleagues at the Allen Institute. We were involved in part of this study in, you know, being able to um, understand how these recordings are done, being able to help them analyze the data. But essentially what was done was um, we had dense extracellular recordings with uh, silicon probes um, that were performed in the primary visual cortex and uh, the lateral geniculate nucleus simultaneously of awake behaving mice. Um, we use these recordings uh, basically to be able to characterize uh, the classical receptive field parameters that would correspond to V1 neurons in awake mice. Um, so uh, we took this data and we computed the average receptive field properties of all neurons that are recorded as part of this experimental setup. And using that, we came up with a simple parameterization for uh, how we would like to represent uh, our V1 neurons uh, in the mouse visual cortex. Essentially, what it, turned to, what it boils down to is that um, we can simply parameterize them uh, for from the data that we collected, it seems that we can simply parameterize them as sums of two Gaussian blobs of opposite polarities. That's what I show in the panel below here. Um, basically, you have a center subfield that is slightly stronger, and then you have a opposite polarity subfield that's slightly weaker than the central subfield. And then um, you can essentially move the non-dominant subfield around uh, we chose to move them around in steps of 45 degrees based off of the data that we had. Um, and using this sort of an approach, we constructed a, a bank of filters, uh, 18 filters that represent mouse V1 neurons putatively, uh, eight of which are shown here. Um, there are eight more with the opposite polarities where the center is white and the surround is dark. And then you have two subfields which are purely on or off meaning they're just white or black in the center. Um, the orientation preference of these vivian neurons, if you will, uh, is determined by the angle of the line joining the centers of these two subfields. So for example, um, the second filter here would represent a neuron that prefers 45 degrees uh, gratings. Okay, um, so given that we had this, um, We had this database of filters. The other ingredient that Stefan had mentioned was uh, natural scene statistics that we need in order to be able to apply our theory. So uh, a natural database for us was the database of natural scenes coming from the Berkeley segmentation data set. Shown here is one representative image from this data set. And what we do is using our assumption of the neuronal code which is that the firing rate represents the probability of a neuron. Uh, As a first step in that, what we do is we take each of our filters in our filter bank, convolve the images present in this data set with those filters, get an output like this, and then eventually we convert this to a firing rate of a neuron, um, which we then use uh, to calculate our weight matrix W, um, the formula for which Stefan had just presented a couple of slides ago. So um, you just run this algorithm through and you end up getting a synaptic weight matrix uh, coming from the modified Hebbian learning rule um, that ends up being four dimensional in our case. Um, the, the respective dimensions being uh, in this representation that I show here, K1 represents the target filter or the target neuron K2 represents the source neuron from which the target neuron is receiving connections from. And then uh, you have a spatial aspect to it where delta X and delta Y represent how far offset these neurons are um, relative to each other in space, okay? So the panel here shows representative connections uh, on a 2D slice of this four-dimensional matrix 
where if you fix K1 and K2, K1 you fix to be this uh, filter with orientation zero degrees. Um, and then you look at the connections that this filter receives from these eight filters that are shown in the top panel here. Um, so once you fix K1 and K2, then what you are left with is a 2D grid of synaptic weights, which is shown in the bottom row here uh, as a heat map. And what each of these subpanels represents is what the connections look like from each of those source filters to the target filter that's shown at the leftmost panel. Um, some interesting things that pop out naturally here, uh, you can see the bow tie shape sort of uh, you know, aspect to these heat maps, which is a well-known phenomenon that happens due to correlations in natural scene statistics. Um, other interesting things are that although these are functional connections between pairs of excited tree neurons, uh, you can see that the weight matrix ends up having both positive and negative connections here. Um, and, you know, basically when you see a negative connection here, it just means that you have two excited tree neurons that are having uh, an anti-correlated effect or, or a net inhibitory effect on each other um, via other synaptic connections, which I'll get to. Okay, um, so um, we have constructed this four-dimensional matrix and now we want to be able to compare it to experimental data. So one of the first ingredients that we want to look at is, uh, does our theory predict the like-to-like -like connectivity patterns that have been observed experimentally uh, from the lab of Thomas Mercisch Logel? And turns out very nicely that um, our model predicts the like-to-like -like nature of the excitatory connections quite well. Uh, what you see here is the of connection between two filters whose preferred orientations are offset by delta theta that's shown on the x-axis. So what this says is that filters who have this, which have the same orientation are more likely preferentially to connect to each other. And as the preferred orientation, as the difference in preferred orientation decrease, increases between them, the probability of connection goes down. Uh, our model is able to capture that aspect quite well, as you can see here. Um, the next thing that we want to look at is when we look at the excitatory connections, are we able to reproduce the distance dependence that has also been experimentally observed? Um, yeah, it looks like there is a question. Yeah, so there's a question. Um, what are the X and Y dimensions of the 18 filters shown on slide 24? Uh, so those are, are, just those, are the... spatial, those are just a spatial grid. So we chose them to be 15 by 15 pixels. You know, with roughly a correspondence that maps on to the actual uh, approximate size of uh, receptive fields that are seen in our experimental data. So give or take, the standard deviation of these turns out to be around seven degrees, and the net size of these filters turns out to be approximately 15 degrees. So that's what, that's what uh, corresponds to the X and Y dimensions of those filters over there. Ren, can you show slide 24 again, just for? Uh, which one again, sorry? Uh, the slide 24, uh, uh, that's yeah. the one you're talking about, right? Yeah. Okay. So there's some filter okay, K1 thanks. that's being detected in the center of the image, and now you're looking at the connections from other each, every other possible filter at different relative spatial offset, offsets. Absolutely. Yep, right. that, that's, that's exactly correct. Uh, any further questions? Um, okay. All right, um, so as I was saying, um, again, one can take all the mean positive connections that we have in our four-dimensional weight matrix, and we can now start to see what the distance dependence of these connections looks like, just because we have a notion of relative spatial offset between these filters. And again, uh, when we plot uh, what the distance dependence of these connections looks like, uh, it, see, it shows that our model is able to reproduce qualitatively the distance dependence that was observed by uh, the group of uh, Levy and Reyes in 2012, um, where they had a space constant for their distance dependence of 114 micrometers. Uh, our model, give or take, uh, with, you know, even with uh, 
all the assumptions and approximations that have gone in does a fairly good job of being able to capture this distance dependence. We are getting 170 microns as our spatial constant from our model. Um, how, how do you compute the spatial constants in the model? Yeah, uh, so just... in this case, in this case uh, the way this was done is uh, in the experimental paper, they fit a Gaussian, a one-sided Gaussian to the distance and then they use the standard deviation of the fit Gaussian to estimate a spatial constant, basically. Uh, so we did the same, uh, we, we took the same approach that was done by the experimental lab in order that we are able to compare. Um, there are a few other details in terms of, you know, what the cortical magnification factor looks like and so on, such that you have, you know, you are mapping actual space to distances on cortex. So there is a cortical yeah. Factor. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Yeah, there's yeah. some, you know, you have pixels coming in. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, so you, you have, have, to have some assumption about that. So there are studies previously from people at the Allen Institute that itself, which have which have shown that uh, there is a cortical magnification factor of approximately five degrees per millimeter, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, off the top of my head. But that's sort of the factor that you use to be able to map distances onto, you know, offsets in uh, cortical space. Thanks. Yeah. Cool. Okay, um, so uh, we are good. We have looked at the excitatory connections. We find good agreement with you know uh, observations that have been found experimentally. But the question still remains that you know most of these are excitatory connections. Um, these are connections, functional connections between excitatory neurons. So we know that biologically inhibitory neurons exist in the cortex and one now can ask the question as to how one can start thinking about introducing inhibitory cells into the model over here, right? Um, the idea here being that most of these negative connections that you're seeing are most likely um, polysynaptic connections that go from excitatory neurons via an inhibitory neuron onto other excitatory neurons. So the net effect of the interaction between those two excitatory neurons will be uh, like an effective inhibition. That's sort of the idea, right? Um, the other aspect of interest here, of course, is that we know that there is a multitude of cell types in the visual cortex. Uh, granted, there are you know, different ways of what we mean, but different ways of defining what we mean by cell type, as Stefan had um, summarized briefly from our studies, right? Uh, but we were interested in seeing if we can actually you know, go in and map some of these computations onto specific components uh, corresponding to excitatory and inhibitory cell types in our model. Um, so to that end, uh, there are you know, different ways of being able to do this, but um, we were sort of you know, quite uh, intrigued by these ideas that were presented by uh, Mengchen Zhu and Chris Rosell from Georgia Tech. Uh, in a study that they had done in Kellogg's computational biology in 2015. Um, they had presented a very nice way of being able to think about how one can, one can start thinking about modeling inhibitory neurons in you know, uh, normative models such as uh, efficient coding, sparse coding, what have you, right? Um, but the crux of their work, um, I can get into the mathematical details for people who are interested later. I won't directly present it here. But the crux of their work was that they wanted to introduce inhibitory neurons into a network model of sparse coding in such a way that you can represent, uh, you can uh, respect biological constraints. The three constraints specifically were uh, Dale's law, which says that you know excitation and inhibition come from distinct cell types. And each of these cell types just, so inhibitory cell types can only provide inhibition to postsynaptic cells, excitatory can provide only excitation to postsynaptic cells, right? You cannot mix them. Um, one way of doing this would be able to take the connectivity matrix that you get from your model and split it into just, you know, two pieces corresponding to a positive part and a negative part, and then you can assign them separately to E and I types. However, uh, there is another constraint, which is most frequently we have you know, a lot of experimental data has shown that uh, roughly speaking, the ratio of excitatory to inhibitory neurons in different brain areas 
is approximately forest to one, right? So one needs to respect this constraint and just splitting it into a positive and negative would mean you have equal copies of excitation and inhibition, which we don't want. So one way to go around that and reduce the number of inhibitory neurons in your model would be to look at something like a low rank decomposition of your connectivity matrix, right? Um, and so that's one way where you can say, okay, the low rank part now tells you that you have a lot more excitatory neurons, you have few inhibitory neurons, and these are talking to each other through your diagonal matrix sigma. Um, going further, uh, you know, Stefan briefly touched upon this, but uh, we do know that inhibitory neurons in the brain also come in different flavors in terms of their physiological properties. Uh, one sort of thing that um, is seen prominently, uh, or a number of studies have seen this phenomenon. I don't think it's a settled issue, but there definitely seems to be a tuning diversity, an orientation tuning diversity amongst inhibitory neurons in that there are subclasses of interneurons that don't seem to have any preferred orientation tuning, whereas there are other interneurons which seem to show very strong preference for gratings of particular orientations, right? So one way that they propose to capture this tuning diversity of inhibitory neurons is to do a low rank plus of sparse decomposition of your matrix, okay? Um, the idea here being that uh, these, this decomposition will allow you to have a part that, um, you know, captures an untuned component of the inhibition, and then the sparse component ends up capturing a tuned component of the inhibition. Um, won't go into details here, but I'll just leave you with, you know, a summary sort of figure from their paper. Uh, the basic idea being, uh, if you see the picture on the right, you have two populations of inhibitory neurons. Mm -hmm. The first population, um, receives non-specific input from all excitatory neurons and sends back projections to all excitatory neurons, whereas the second one receives input only from a subset of the excitatory neurons, and this is how it ends up being orientation tuned. Uh, you can decompose this and now split up these decomposed pieces separately into positive and negative aspects, right? And now you can start saying that there are different pieces to your types of inhibition, uh, an untuned part, a tuned part, and then there is a net excited trip part. So this was sort of a very nice study that they had published in 2015. And we used this idea. Um, our, our computational goal was different. It was not sparse coding. It is optimal context integration. But in principle, the same sort of idea can be applied to our framework in order to be able to start thinking about what different aspects of inhibition are there. How do we start splitting up our um, weight matrix into you know, uh, specific cell types. So on this uh, slide, I just summarized that when we do this sort of a decomposition on our weight matrix, you can see again that the sparse part um, looks very similar to the actual full weight matrix that I had shown, but the sparse component ends up showing a lot more of you know, localized features um, and, uh, you know, just provides us uh, an additional handle to be able to look at these different components. Um, the main takeaways from this uh, that we have seen so far is one can go ahead and look at, again, the orientation and distance dependence of these uh, separate subtypes of connections. The, it turns out that the excitatory connections shown in red here match well with the experimental data shown on the left, whereas the inhibitory components show sort of interesting differences. There is a tuned component of the inhibitory component and uh, untuned component coming from the sparse part. Um, and these are, you know, things that uh, can be tested experimentally uh, with further refined studies, hopefully which will come up in the future. Um, yeah, this slide just summarizes that qualitatively the distance dependencies are also uh, similar. The sparse positive connections are a lot more local compared to the others, which are all around 155 microns. And uh, again, such distance dependence date, uh, such distance dependence predictions could be in principle tested by using electron microscopy data that we hope to be able to have soon. Um, so uh, to summarize my part of the talk, um, we 
we took this model, we took a database of natural scenes and parameterized data from mouse electrophysiological recordings. And we were able to take that, apply it to the database of natural scenes, obtain a connectivity matrix, and then uh, potentially propose um, mapping of some of these computations in the network model as being mediated by different types of inhibitory neurons uh, where you know you have a local normalization that is done and that is uh, we, we, we are just proposing as one proposal here that they could be mediated by parvalbum and interneurons whereas the uh, surround inhibition which is known where SST interneurons are known to be involved could potentially be uh, mediated by two subpopulations of SST neurons. However, I would like to mention in general that there might not be a direct correspondence between computations and actual cell types. This is just, you know, one of the simpler proposals that we could come up with in our, in, in our, in our published work. Hey, Ram, uh, there is a question uh, from the audience uh, from Dave. Maybe I'll try unmuting Dave uh, okay. If you would like to ask directly, if not, I can I can read out your question. Uh, so you should be able to unmute, Dave, if you would like to ask. Uh, okay, uh, perhaps not. Uh, so his his question is um, uh, in the Zoo and Roselle paper mentioned on slide thirty, the filters were elliptical blobs with different orientations, but your filters were two Gaussians blobs with opposite polarity. Could you please explain why these are different? Um, so, yes, um, we are not wedded to just using Gaussian blobs. We have actually applied the theory to different types of filters. In Zhu and Roselle, they uh, were primarily, you know, they were primarily interested in using Gabor filters as a way of, you know, it, it's a standard sort of uh, assumption that neurons in, let's say, cats and monkeys and what have you. Uh, are well represented by Gabor filters, right? In the mouse, this sort of a Gabor sort of thing doesn't seem to exist. However, what I would like to mention is that our theory does not restrict itself to just using uh, blobs, right? We use blobs only because the data showed us that blobs are a good representation of mice. But um, in, in our paper, we have also explored Gabors and you know other sorts of filters that could presumably be present in animals with better acuity than mouse, uh, but the general results seem to hold. I think we have one other question from Kevin. Uh, okay. Go ahead, can Kevin. I, can I drag you back to slide 24 again? Sure. Okay, so, uh, yeah. so one of the things I'm noticing is there is a lack of expected uh, symmetry in some of these patterns, like between uh, the 90 degree patterns. And I'm wondering if you, instead of picking 45 degree increments, if you pick something like 60 or 30 degrees that you'd get a better symmetry. I'm just thinking hexagonal close packing might be somehow representative of what's actually going on. Hmm. I can try to answer that. The lack of symmetry is probably not clear in here, but this filters carry uh, some luminosity information as well. The information coming from the white and black blob are not identical. And that is a peculiarity of the mouse uh, visual system. Again, this theory works on any type of filters. It can, anything can be put in here. We just wanted to compare with the data from the mouse and mouse is not the most regular. And some of the lack of symmetry is something which has also been observed in here. Uh, it would also be great if we have, if people have another five minutes to hear how this can be applied to artificial neuronal networks from Brian. Brian, do you want to request control? Uh, I think Ram should just zoom through the slides. Yeah, Ram needs to stop okay. and then, okay. um, and yeah. uh, I should say it's about 11.05. Um, uh, just time that, that is one, 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 one brief idea would be good to if we can get to that, but oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Uh, take uh, I don't know if I can request control from my computer, so, so either you or Ram should just. I can. Through. I can go through your okay. slides if you want to. So yeah, uh, we. So again, hi, my name is Brian. Uh, I will talk about the application of this kind of theory to uh, essentially neural networks. And so here we want to try to close the loop. We've talked a lot about local computations. We want to 
think about how uh, this type of local computation could also work in networks which are being optimized for more global computation, such as a task like object recognition. Okay, next slide. So to better understand this, uh, I want to pretty much introduce the ideas of supervised and unsupervised learning. So this figure comes from a recent review paper, but essentially with the rise of essentially compute power and large amounts of labeled data, we have computer vision systems that can do all types of tasks now. So in this case, given an input image in the upper uh, left here, we, you can train this model to do object detection, label boundaries, predict surfaces, all types of different things. Uh, but one of the limitations of uh, this type of technique, uh, next slide, Stefan, is that it requires, uh, one back, sorry. Uh, it requires a lot of labeled data. So essentially you need to have examples of each kind of condition that you want to learn. And this is usually very expensive. In contrast, uh, unsupervised learning, uh, next slide. Yeah, uh, the purpose of unsupervised learning is to try to discover patterns in the input without labels. And so some, Common examples of this are clustering, anomaly detection, uh, using autoencoders, or some form of Hebbian learning, which is most similar to what we use here. And then you can view, for instance, like hierarchical temporal memory as a method that combines anomaly detection and Hebbian learning. Um, so here, this is a basic schematic of our setup. So you can imagine in a in a deep neural network, you have connections between two different hierarchical layers in the model. So you can have a layer L and a layer L minus one. Within each of these layers, you have different sets of features. And then you, within each uh, feature map, you have essentially different spatial locations. So here, uh, the purpose of supervised learning is to learn uh, a set of feed flow weights U here, uh, which allow you to perform the computation. And so it's essentially a set of weights from one spatial location in a given layer to uh, the layer on top. And, he, and usually in convolutional neural networks, these weights are shared across space. Um, and then uh, what we add to this kind of model, uh, Stefan, next slide, is essentially uh, this W weight matrix, which is a set of lateral connections, in this case, which are learned uh, via unsupervised learning. And essentially we're taking the same principles which were talked about uh, earlier in the talk, where we're essentially computing statistics of the activations of units within each uh, layer in the model over a set of images uh, X here at the very bottom. And we're essentially recording um, these activations and we can compute the weights essentially using the same equation that was shown earlier. But uh, in order to get this to work in uh, these networks, we make two very minor assumptions. But essentially one is that um, instead of requiring all of the information to be independent from the independent patches, as this is very hard to enforce in neural networks, we allow for overlapping receptive fields. And we essentially scale the contribution from these kind of uh, overlapping receptive fields by a hyperparameter, which can be controlled. And then Stefan mentioned earlier that uh, the contribution from these extra classical receptive fields was multipl multiplicative um, in the most formal sense but we relax this assumption and essentially allow for an additive contribution, which is similar to like linear, linearizing uh, this model. Okay. And so uh, we hypothesize that um, one case where these lateral connections could be very useful in neural networks is when you add noise to images. And in this case, uh, the noise essentially corrupts the information that's present in the, essentially the feed forward response of a neuron. And so you can try to average out some of this noise if you're going to be talking to some of the other units in, in the same uh, layer. And the hope is that these lateral connections will provide you some robustness to noise. So to test this, we took the MNIST data set, we applied to- hey, Bri Brian, of, yeah. I have a quick question. So sure. when you train the lateral connections here, uh, uh, is that trained on MNIST as well, or is that from uh, the, the the natural data set used before? Yeah, so um, I skipped over that detail, but essentially we take a baseline neural network, we train it via supervised learning on uh, essentially clean images of MNIST, and then we freeze the weights uh, of the of that network, and so this provides essentially the same thing as like the 
few forward receptive fields that Ram showed earlier. And these are what we use to compute the activations. And then we learn essentially the lateral connections in an unsupervised manner where we don't use the labels of the images, but we're just recording activations and then computing the weights accordingly. Okay, and that's done using MNIST data set as well. Yes, correct. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, and so what we did is we tested uh, our models on these two types of uh, images, noisy images. So here I'll walk through, this is essentially the final table of results. So the CNN model is the baseline model. It's a very simple model, which has two convolutional layers followed by two fully connected layers. So on clean MNIST images on the test set, it gets accuracy around 99%, which is pretty standard. Uh, as you can see, as you increase uh, levels of noise, the, not surprisingly, the accuracy drops. And then um, the next essentially four rows uh, show our uh, proposed model, which we called CNNX, which is convolutional neural networks with this contribution from extra classical receptive fields via these learned lateral connections. And then in this case, uh, the main observation is that the baseline CNN model does pretty well at low noise levels, which is expected if the data matches the distribution that it was trained on. But at high noise, um, essentially the CNN X model does much better. And so here we have the baseline CNN X model, which is the second row. We have a control model, which is essentially take lateral connections, but all the lateral connections do are average the activations of the surrounding units. So this is essentially a control for uh, the fact that you can average out noise by looking at more neurons, um, but that doesn't do much better. Um, and then we also did the same kind of weight decomposition that Ram talked about. So either taking the low rank component of the lateral connections or the sparse component, and we found that including just the sparse component of the lateral connections in the CNN X model allowed for the best performance um, at high noise levels. Okay. Uh, Brian, just to clarify, the lateral connections are, are between features or between patches of data? Yeah, so um, you can imagine the lateral connections essentially being an additional layer of weights in your model. So you have your two essentially feedforward uh, convolutional layers. And then after each of those convolutional layers, we insert an additional layer of lateral connections, which aren't trained uh, using supervised learning, but they're trained using this unsupervised learning rule. And they essentially connect, they're convolutional as well. So they tile the whole feature map, but then they connect essentially different units uh, at different spatial locations and with different feature selectivities. So you can view it as essentially a recurrent, uh, spatially recurrent weight layer. Okay, and, and can you talk a bit about the connection with uh, other models which are similar and uh, add cite two models here, the contracted predictive coding and the recent application of the transformers model to convolution to, to vision as well uh, that we've seen in the RIPs last year. Um, I'm not as familiar, unfortunately, with those models, but I think the basic idea, I would say like as a guiding principle for this model is we start with some inspiration from biology. So we take essentially this Hebbian-like learning rule, which is uh, we observe in the biology and is built essentially based on first principles of keeping track of which units essentially fire together over a set of images. And then we take that same rule and we just try to apply it uh, to lateral connections. And I think um, in, in these neural networks, and I think there's a lot of room for future research in, in terms of how to combine like supervised learning along with this unsupervised learning. Because right now we're doing kind of a hacky way where we train the model in a fully supervised manner, freeze the feed forward weights, and then uh, learn the lateral connections. But you can imagine more hybrid schemes where you kind of learn both simultaneously or you, you have an alternating way. But that's kind of future research. Yeah, you could have uh, you know, continued that supervised training and fine tuned the supervised yeah. weights, you know, keeping the lateral weights fixed uh, yeah. as well. That would be interesting. Mm -hmm. That might close some of this accuracy gap. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay, so um, thanks, Brian. Yeah, sure. And then I guess to play this game again, what do you think is behind the red square? All right. So given time constraints, we'll ask for audience feedback. But essentially, these are the conclusions <laughs> of our um, main talk. So again, outlined by these basic kind of bullet points, our hypothesis is that cortex 
this hierarchically organized, but then it also consists of these canonical local circuits, which we tried to understand here. And then that the brain isn't necessarily optimizing one cost function, but there could be different cost functions at the local circuit level and the global circuit level. Uh, so here we propose a theory um, of starting from first principles and integrating information of lateral connections that can help with context integration. Uh, we apply this both to biological data. So in this case, looking at uh, receptive fields from the mouse, and we found that there was a good experimental match. And then as a proof of concept, we started into looking how can we apply these principles also to artificial neural networks and try to incorporate uh, these lateral connections there and what kind of benefit they can provide. So. Great, thanks. Um, thanks very much. <laughs> Virtual clapping. Um, so I think Kevin has another question. Go ahead and then Niels, uh, I'll unmute you if you want to try to ask the question after Kevin. So the step where uh, the multiplicative uh, uh, step for the inhibition is changed to additive and you invoke a Taylor series expansion to uh, do that. Uh, why not go to a logarithmic uh, step so that the uh, so then it's additive in that space uh, as an alternative i can probably answer that because the uh, traditional computations of the feed forward connections need to be additive so if we want to do things which are going to be the more standard convolutional neuronal networks would be so it would be difficult to combine by just one log transform of both the uh, feed forward and the later and the lateral connections. But at least in the Mnet's case, he has all that isolated out to a separate uh, weight layer. So, uh, how difficult could it be? I I think it is possible. I think you would have to worry potentially about like numerical stability type things mm -hmm. when when you when you do that, but it's something we didn't really test uh, actively, but I, I assume it is possible to do something like that. Okay. Okay, Niels, go ahead. Yeah, uh, that was really interesting. Um, and so Brian, I was just wondering, do you have a chance to look at uh, adversarial noise uh, in your... Uh, with yeah, CNN? so when we submitted these uh, this to different conferences and things like reviewers always ask that and that wasn't the focus <laughs> right. of essentially um, what we we're proposing but i think that is that is an interesting direction to think like why is the brain and why is the human visual system so robust to these kind of adversarial perturbations and it's possible that feedback connections lateral connections could uh, provide some substrate for that but we haven't actively pursued too much of this in this direction but it's something that um, i'm interested in Okay. Yeah, it would definitely, it's definitely an interesting direction, particularly if, you're, if it's hard to uh, take the gradient uh, across those connections. It would actually make it harder for adversarial techniques, uh, potentially. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Getting a lot, lot of kudos on the chat for, uh, for a great presentation. Any yeah, other I'll... questions from anyone? Jeff, go ahead. I just want to say the same thing. I thought you guys did a really great job presenting, very clear, very well thought through and interesting, uh, interesting results. So I appreciate the effort that went into that. Yeah, it's really Thank nice to much. see the relationship back to biology. As yeah, well just, as I love learning. to see people doing uh, that cool. in any form. It's just, it was really great. You know, the, the way you yeah. partitioned it up was really wonderful. Thank you very much for inviting us. Uh, thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. And uh, we'll post the recording in a, in a couple of days. So um, you'll be able to point people to it. So thank great. You. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. All right. Stay safe, guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.